Good morning, everybody. I am uh, Sarah Howe, the co-chair of the planning team for the symposium with Heidi Madden, who is sitting in the front over here. And a little later, I'll ask the planning team to stand up. Uh, despite the date, Friday the 13th, today is a very lucky day. We've, we're feeling, we here are more than 100 people. We've arrived here in Frankfurt from more than 10 countries. And we have, as individuals, many different specializations and passions in the arena of libraries and the scholarly and civic enterprise, which you will see uh, on display in the posters and hear about um, um, in the talks. And I think the great variety is one of the strengths of, of you know, what has happened to be pulled together today. Um, this event is sponsored by the Center for Research Libraries in Chicago through two of its global resources project groups. Uh, the two are CIFNAL, which stands for, and I usually get it wrong, Collaborative Initiative for French Language Collections, I think, and, uh, but in general, and GNARP, the German North American Resources Partnership. We are deeply, deeply thankful to Uta Schwentz, the director of the German National Library in Frankfurt, for hosting us, for supporting us, for Say, you know, for encouraging us, and please allow her to welcome us uh, today, along with Emmanuel Bermes on behalf of the National Library of France, and Bernie Riley on behalf of the Center for Research Libraries. And housekeeping will follow at the end of the welcomes. Thanks. Well, good morning, everybody, from me too. Dear colleagues, dear guests from Germany, France, from the United States, but also from other countries abroad, welcome to the German National Library this day. We are very much honored to be the host of today's international symposium and thank the American colleagues from the Collaborative Initiative for French Library Collections and the German North American Resources Partnerships, as Sarah already mentioned, um, for organizing this meeting, this conference today. The Frankfurt Book Fair, with its guest of honor, France, gives the wonderful opportunity to have also French colleagues with us, so an explicit welcome to them, too. What challenges confront 21st century research libraries in Europe and North America? How can libraries more deeply engage and support scholars throughout the full life cycle of learning, digital scholarship, and interdisciplinary, interdisciplinary research partnerships? How can libraries maintain excellence both in both services and collections across a multiplicity of formats? How might regional or transnational institutional and professional alliances forge agile, sustainable collaborations to add in this work? I think you know these questions, and these questions were used when the call for papers was published at the end of last year. We thought that all libraries have to work at these issues make their minds on strategies and activities. And looking at the program of this symposium, I'm sure that we will hear a lot of internal, bilateral, or multilateral discussions about ongoing developments, and we will learn a lot from the experiences of other colleagues. Having this in mind, I wish the conference good presentations, both via lectures and the posters during the break, fruitful discussions, both in the audience in this room, but also during breaks, and a wonderful atmosphere. I would like to thank the planning team, especially Sarah Howe and Heidi Madden, for doing a wonderful job, and Barbara Fischer, Tobias Schmidt, and Steffen Krom at the German National Library supported the planning team as much as they could or today still do, and thanks to them too. And finally, we all thank the sponsors for their financial support, which was also very essential 
for the realization of this conference. So, dear colleagues, welcome again. Have a successful day. Thank you. Dear colleagues, uh, it's a great pleasure for me to uh, be representing uh, the BNF today and to be able to greet you uh, to this uh, symposium. Um, when, the, when we heard about uh, the Frankfurt Book Fair being focused on France this year, uh, we were very eager to be uh, part of this event. And then when we got in touch with the organizers of this event today, um, it was really thrilling because it came exactly at the right time uh, for us uh, in terms of uh, aligning our own topics, uh, our own preoccupations with addressing the needs of uh, scholars in a digital world uh, as we are uh, developing our digital strategy. As you may know, we have uh, started uh, entering the digital world uh, a long time ago as uh, Gallica, our digital library, is celebrating its 20 years. And uh, last year we also celebrated the 10th anniversary of our uh, digital legal deposit uh, law. So this is a very timely um, event for us to have the opportunity, after having focused for so many years on how to create our digital collections and preserve them, now we can share with you all uh, our preoccupations on how these collections are being used and how uh, researchers are developing new strategies uh, for digital scholarship using these uh, digital collections. So this is really important to us because uh, although we are very uh, special in the sense that we are a national library and in particular in France we are not part of the higher education network, we are really an academic and research library. And we are really eager to be part of this community and to exchange uh, with you all on, on the developments of uh, the relationship between libraries and research. So this is a very uh, timely topic for, for us that we will have the opportunity to discuss it again uh, today uh, uh, along this program which seems uh, really, really interesting. So I would like to thank you, uh, thank the organizing team, the program committee, uh, of course, thanking, thank the Deutsche National Bibliothek for having us today uh, and the CRL and the sponsors. Thank you all for partnering with us on, on this event. I'm sure it will be uh, really interesting and, and amazing today. Thank you. Good morning, I'm Bernard Riley, uh, President of the Center for Research Libraries. On behalf of the Board and the members of the Center for Research Libraries, welcome to New Directions for Library Scholars and Partnerships. The, um, I want to thank um, Dr. Svens of the Deutsche National Bibliothek for hosting the, the conference, this important conference today. It was actually here in 2015 where uh, we from the Center for Research Libraries met with the Deutsche Forschungsgemeinschaft representatives to begin what turned into the Global Collections Initiative. Global Collections Initiative you'll hear a little bit about later today, but it's an um, initiative uh, funded by the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation in the U.S., uh, whereby CRL is working with um, partners in Germany, the U.K., and Canada to rethink, reconceptualize, and redesign the supply chain for resources for international and area studies. The conference today is very timely. We live in a time when po the politics of nationalism are making borders more rigid and confining. Library cooperation has to transcend those national boundaries. We live in a time when the information industry is larger and more commercialized than ever. Data is more costly and complex, and in this, this environment, international cooperation is not just an option, but it's an imperative. We live in a time when facts are widely challenged and de devalued. 
the, um, in this environment, libraries need to join together to reassert the value of evidence, records, and documentation. So my hope for today is that the presentations will provoke creativity and inspire action and international cooperation, which has never been more important. Thank you very much. Thank you all very much for setting the tone for the day. Um, now, I have a list of housekeeping. The first one is um, members of the planning team have stars on their badges. Speakers have colored dots. Um, we stopped there. Um, but uh, I wonder if members of the planning team would stand, please, so that... Um, <laughs> Um, and actually, if the one in the way in the back would keep standing. <laughs> Judy Alsbach works for CRL, and she's the person whose initial, sure, if people will come, um, I'll support it, made this whole thing possible. So, and she has been amazing, as have every single member of the planning team. We. Um, we've had a lot of fun, I think. So I'm a little sad. I wasn't, I didn't, I wasn't going to say this, but I'm a little sad that it's today. So anyway, <laughs> um, but everyone has been really thoughtful and energetic in their participation and contribution and helpful and collegial and honest and outspoken. And so it's been, been terrific. Thank you all for coming. Actually, will the speakers for the first session come up, please? Super brief introductions. Dorothea Summer, whose name I've mispronounced, is a scholar who's been an experienced subject librarian and is currently Deputy Director General of the Bavarian State Library in Munich. Um, I've never been there. I understand it's a huge library in a castle with uh, deep historical collections and um, one of the most amazing digitization cent centers. Um, Doris Grutter, um, here on my immediate left, earned her doctorate in Romance Languages and Linguistics and is currently responsible for Germany's National Discipline Specific Research Service for French and Italian Studies at the University in Bonn, uh, particularly interesting to those of us here who are are the Romance Studies specialists rather than the Germanic languages specialists. Uh, she's been, she is responsible for um, not only the current service-based uh, center, but also was responsible for its institutional predecessor, the National Subject Collection for Romance Languages and Literatures, uh, and had been since 2008. Emmanuel Bermes has worked in digital libraries and digital preservation and with many international initiatives. She's currently Deputy Director of Services and Networks at the National Library of France. So, thank you all. No. This is all. Right. I, I will find. Good. Oh, good. Thank you. Dear colleagues, um, first I would like to thank you very much for the invitation to speak at this symposium during the Frankfurt Book Fair. And it will be a great pleasure for me to give you, with my presentation, some information on aspects, developments, and challenges regarding the introduction of specialized information services in the German library sector. In the following, I will try to give you some more and deeper insights into current developments connected with a very new approach that the implementation of specialized information services means, in particular as it is experienced in one of the largest universal libraries in Germany, the Bavarian State Library in Munich. 
um, with over 11 million media and more than 2 million digital publications. We are the only library in Germany which has digitized its copy-free holdings with Google. The Bavarian State Library is one of the important content preserving and providing memory institutions in Germany. Um, traditionally, it has participated and benefited from the system of special subject collections that was established by the German Research Foundation, the DFG, um, soon after the Second uh, World War in 1949. And dating back to these early beginnings, um, the Bavarian State Library has until now pursued a collection policy on a national level for the subject fields of history, including uh, several European studies, area studies such as France, Italy, and Spain, um, classical studies, musicology, and Eastern European studies. The funding policy of the German Research Foundation has been generous. However, it has always been based on a ratio of two-thirds um, funding costs um, for the comprehensive collections and one-third contribution of the respective institution itself. The system of special subject collections has thus had a long tradition. It was, however, several times monitored and adjusted some years ago, um, including the involvement um, of the um, new federal states um, from the territory of the um, former GDR, and um, the introduction of the virtual collections, um, the so-called VIFA, um, at the beginning of 2004. And the latter development uh, was already closely linked to the current media shift as it aimed at the inclusion of free internet um, resources and other digitally available items. However, this system was evaluated um, again in 2011 um, with the uh, result, um, and it resulted in, I could say, in a severe and disruptive decision of the funding policy of the German Research Foundation and a respective disruptive and far-reaching um, restructuring and transformation process for research libraries. And uh, this can suitably be described with the slogan um, from collection to connection, what you all know, or as the president of the German Research Foundation, Professor Peter Strohschneider, pointedly called it in a publication as the end of the collection. However, I would like to add that he put a question mark behind the statement. Um, in the timeline, um, you can also see um, that the new funding program cycle started in 2013 um, to 2015, and next year an extensive um, evaluation process will begin. Um, but what is the background um, of this restructuring and what are the consequences and findings of the process that started in 2012? As to the background, we will have to consult politics and the consequences will certainly show in the collections and services libraries will be able to provide in the future. The results will be evaluated and judged in the very next years before a decision for further commitment and a long-term financing by the Research Foundation will be made. First, however, let us explore a bit the intentions of the German Research Foundations. Here, libraries as infrastructural institutions are faced with the fact that the German Research Foundation does not balance varying concerns between um, content holding and providing institutions and research. The German Research Foundation acts first and foremost in the interests of the research community. And this is evidently its primary task and following that goal, it pursues the implementation of an efficient scientific information infrastructure. Thus, um, the German Research Foundation clearly stated in 2014, um, in particular, the contribution of the DFG funding policy directed at future-oriented information 
infrastructure is no longer targeted at a comprehensive collection of literature. Moreover, it stated that a precise description and clarification of roles of the stakeholders involved in the process of providing an efficient information infrastructure is necessary. In that context, the German Research Foundation defined actually two funding principles that shed further light on the motives of this transformation. The funding of the specialized information services is based on the presupposition that the expectations and needs of the scientific disciplines are so diverse that a uniform and homogeneous way of implementation cannot be outlined in advance and anticipated. It has to be created strictly according to the specific research interests of the academic community. And secondly, services have to be developed in a way that libraries with specialized information services have to concentrate on emerging digital services which are not yet available elsewhere and which differ sufficiently from aspects of basic services. This new approach is thus clearly user-orientated and relies heavily on demands and requirements of the academic community with its varying research interests that is no longer on an anticipative and comprehensive collection building. And the focus has shifted from collections to access and to the provision of digital services that further increase access to content both in print and digital. However, I think it is worth con considering the fact that the access for researchers provided by the libraries is already on a historically an excellent high standard for numerous reasons. Nevertheless, there's obviously a perception that demands remain unfulfilled and access gaps still exist to continue. Consequently, the German Research Foundation intended to address these issues with a modified funding policy. It is crucial to remember that there are various stakeholders involved who take an interest in improving access to research. These are the research founders, universities, libraries and archives, publishers and researchers. But what is obviously needed is a coordination and collaboration of all partners involved and an awareness that these different groups do not necessarily share priorities or preferred ways to achieve that goal. Moreover, I would like to stress the notion and necessity of establishing partnerships between stakeholders rather than the idea of servicing a defined research community with special and varying interests. Before I further comment on this, I would like to provide you with some general uh, results of the transformation process of special uh, subject collections to specialized information services. Between 2012 and 2015, libraries applied subsequently for transformation of their special co uh, subject collections within the framework of the new funding program. Altogether, 31 specialized information services were implemented. The new policy was realized in the course of three funding cycles. The first funding cycle in 2013, we had 12 applications with five successful proposals, meaning 39% approval of grants. The second cycle in 2014, there were 12 applications with again five successful proposals. And the third cycle, um, we had 25 applications with 21 successful proposals. Obviously, the libraries had meanwhile adjusted their strategies as well. Only four information services included in their program costs an acquisition budget of more than 70%, whereas 21 of 31 accepted proposals have an acquisition component of less than 60%. However, at the same time, it has to be noted that the German Research Foundation did not lower its overall funding rate. 
In fact, we can observe an increase compared to the funding rates for the special subject collection system, here with an annual rate of 15 million euro. Nevertheless, the rate of the institutional contribution, the so-called Eigenanteil, shows an increase above the usual average of one-third of the overall funding. At least this is the case for the four specialized information services the Bavarian State Library is responsible for. The decision of the German Research Foundation to transform the system of special subject collections to the provision of specialized information services caused a lot of uncertainty and doubt within the German library world. Collection building, both print and digital, and thus a comprehensive content and information provision, is still widely regarded as one of the main tasks. However, according to the principles of the new program, collection building can only be pursued if it is flexible and driven by clearly defined special demands of the research community. And according to the new funding policy, broad and comprehensive collection building is now regarded as part of the basic services of libraries. Um, the Director General of the Bavarian State Library actually commented on that process and said, in view of the fact that the specialized information services even more aim at complementary support of research by way of highly specialized content and value-added services than the former subject special collections, content and services which often are only marginally used at the respective library, it will not be easy to convince the library's funding bodies to take over this responsibility. Let us now have a closer look what the intended right-sizing of access to scholarly resources means for the library in charge of a specialized information service. I would like to focus here on the Special Information Service for History and European Area Studies at the Bavarian State Library as a prominent example. Altogether, the library is responsible, as I said already, for four specialized information services um, musicology, classical studies, historical studies, Russian East and Southeast European studies. Um, the Bavarian State Library has one of the most important and outstanding collections of historical literature worldwide. And um, it dates back to the foundation of the library in 1558 and includes superb historical holdings such as 20,000 incunables nearly 100,000 manuscripts, as well as many special collections, uh, such as the collections of the history of the First and Second World War and comprehensive Bavaria collections, of course. Altogether, we have approximately uh, 3.5 million books on history and about 4,900 4, journals. Since 1949, the library has collected not only German history, but also history of Austria and Switzerland, France, Italy, Spain, and Portugal. European history in general and world history. Our collections cover all periods of times and all subdisciplines of history, and there are books and other media in numerous languages, not just in German. There are two distinctive features that are characteristic of the transformation process at the Bavarian State Library, that is collaboration and advice. Various collaboration has had a long tradition within the service and has just reached a higher level of quality with the partnering institutions such as the Deutsche Museum in Munich, as well as with institutions such as the Brandenburg Academy of Science and the Institute for Zeitgeschichte. Advice, however, implies a new governance structure for successful specialized information services. And in order to determine the requirements and demands of the German academic community in the field of history, it was necessary to establish a close communication within the leading experts in this field. And these were found in the respective association and the Verband of the Historiker and Historikerinnen Deutschlands. Historians were chosen as consultants 
and on the basis of some general assumptions. Um, we wanted experts um, whose research covers most, the most important time periods um, of history. They should also stand for the most important subdisciplines of history as well as the very centers for excellent research in the field of history in Germany. And we were finally lucky enough to establish an advisory committee that consists of 16 designated experts in the fields of history. The committee has a central conciliating and moderating role between the specialized information service at the library and the world of science. It provides recommendations for the development and implementation of services and comments on achieved results. The subdiscipline history of technology again has another separate um, advisory committee. Furthermore, when contacting the German Historical Association, it was agreed that the Bavarian State Library will regularly report to the subdivision history in the digital world of this association. Another means of giving information as well as receiving feedback is the participation of library staff who is in charge of the service at congresses as the German Conference for Historians or the Society for the History of Technology. I should like to add that all specialized subject services that are operated at the Bavarian State Library have meanwhile a constituted advisory committee. And to be frank, also the historians, musicologists, the classical philologists, as well as the historians for Eastern Europe, they all had to learn that collection building of print resources was no longer the chosen perpetuating funding model of the German Research Foundation. The library and the experts together identified five fields of action for the implementation of the Specialized Information Service for History. Um, the first field of action is acquisition and licensing, and you see also the partners who are involved there. Then we concentrated on search and access systems, and another module is the German historical biography with again, partners involved, and we also follow up digitization uh, and electronic publications. And of course, the communication with target groups and evaluation plays a very important role. In addition, advice, input, and participation was sought from institutions such as uh, the advisory board for the portal History of Science and Technology, the Society for the History of Technology, and the Conference for Didactics of History. And of course, we have also in Munich a special network for historical sciences, which includes the Bavarian State Academy of Science. Um, let's come to the components of the program. According to the vote of the special scientific advisory committee, as well as that of the German Historical Society, the specialized information services for history pursue now a restricted preventive collection building policy within the framework of special provision with best possible access to historical literature. As it turned out, it is not always very easy to distinguish between defined special and basic provision of literature. The Bavarian State Library had to design carefully differentiated acquisition profiles for the selection of literature. Sorry? Okay. Okay. Um, history includes, as already mentioned, also some area studies. And um, we have um, yeah, I, I have to wrap it up very, very fast. No, I, I wanted to give you also a description of, of the program, of what it actually comp, um, contains. Um, so we have PDA, we have the Wunschbuch, and um, we have also a variety um, of digital um, services now included. And, um, and these digital services that were introduced um, actually show that uh, we deal with um, lots of big data and an aggregate of data. Um, here you see the um, pages like Historicum Net, um, where 
and also very important, the German uh, historical bibliography, um, which is really built on an aggregate collection of data from diverse sources, such as the data of the uh, working group of historical research institutions. Um, and altogether, 840,000 data sets of data were actually to be migrated into the catalogues of the Bavarian State Library. So um, that is one of the main tasks. And we also will have a regional um, platform um, which will um, show, um, um, yeah, which will introduce also the the, um, the regions of, of history. So that's an, a further extension. So I have to come to the conclusion now, um, because I'm short of time. Um, this uh, very short survey of the components of the services shows that on the one hand side, there's a complex participative process to organize in order to identify the demands um, of the research community and to thus legitimize the often cost-intensive implementation for the funding institution. And I try to make visible to the fact that the library accomplishes the digital services by the use and reuse of data, often very big data, it holds and curates. Nevertheless, there remains the question of who needs whom. The library seeks input and advice from the research community. The curators of our collections perceive themselves as part of the research community but the realization and implementation, the constant support of these digital services, and this means altogether 38 uh, digital services, um, which we have um, at the State Library, uh, can only be achieved by the work of the staff of, of the library. And due to these complex issues, when modeling the technical infrastructures, it was sometimes not possible to realize every idea and request randomly and short term, which is not always understand by some representatives from the academic sector. Libraries have to apply standards and metadata. Um, and for scientists do not always have to, the perception of that these data they can provide should be fair in the sense of being findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. And moreover, we should actually ask the question, does permanence still matter? Collections, both digital and in print, are obviously in a constant flux. And the systems and services, however, should be designed to be adaptable, but stable and sustainable as well. And let us hope that the transformation towards the system for specialized information services Will, pro provide, will prove to provide the desired results for the creation of a heterogeneous but efficient information infrastructure for the science in Germany. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Sama. So with the acquisitions fundings that you receive, um, does that, is that funding include funding to cover the costs of records for access to the collections? Or is that part of the contribution that's expected to come from the participating institutions? Um, actually, the, the, the cost of the records, we, we create the records ourselves. So um, okay. we get the funding for print resources and, of course, um, extensive electronic licensing together with other institutions. Yeah. Thank you very much. It's a related question. I would like to know if with this funding you also get money f to hire people? Like yes, yes. Um, that is new. Um, we, uh, in order to, to develop the digital services, um, we have opportunities to, to hire people, that's true. Yeah. But this is a temporal job. That is temporary, yeah. As, as I tried to explain uh, the decision whether these services w will be sustainable, I, I think they will, but uh, this decision has to be still taken, yeah. Okay. Sorry for the rush. <laughs>
Yeah, good, good morning. Uh, I'm very glad to have the opportunity to present the services of the Specialized Information Service for Romance Studies, FED Romanistic, in short, FID, or FID, as I learned yesterday. <laughs> mm. On the slide, you can see what I'm going to talk about uh, after some general information concerning the FAID. I'll give you a short overview of the various services. I'll conclude with our strategies to guarantee permanent and long-term communication with the scholars of our discipline. The information service is run by Bonn University and State Library and Hamburg State and University Library since January 2016. The project is funded by the German Research Foundation, DFG, as part of its specialized information services program, which replaces the former special subject collections. We already heard about this by Dr. Sommer. The FED Romanistic thus replaces the former subject collections Romance Languages and Literatures, French Language and Literature, Italian Language and Literature, and Spain-Portugal. In the context of the new program, the main goal consists in developing infrastructures and services which are tailored to the specific needs of the respective research community and represent an addition to the standard services provided by local university libraries. And the activities of the FED for Roman Studies during the current period of the project, 2016 until 2018, concentrate on the following issues. Providing access to printed and electronic media, setting up a subject-specific search portal, and particular projects in the fields of open access publishing and the management of research data. Mm. The profile of the FED uh, uh, for Roman Studies has been defined in collaboration with the research community and more precisely with the representatives of the seven professional associations for Roman languages and in Germany. There is an association for Roman philology, for French philology, for Spanish philology, for Italian philology, for Lusitanian philology, Catalan philology, and uh, an association for Romance languages and literatures of the Balkan countries. Um, and uh, we, um, we have, uh, uh, there's a collaboration with all representatives of all these uh, professional associations. Mm. The profile comprises all Romance languages and uh, the following disciplines. Languages and literature, cultural media and translation studies, and specialized didactics. With respect to the acquisition and indexing of literature, we consider two related information services. On the one hand, the FID for Latin America, Caribbean and Latino studies, run by the Ibero-American Institute at Berlin, and on the other hand, the FID for Eastern European Studies, run by the Bavarian State Library in Munich. Dr. Sommer presented this already. The responsibility for French studies lies with the Bonn University and State Library, where the subject has a long tradition. Since 1949, the library has been in charge of the special subject collection French Language and Literature. It has built up an extensive collection of printed media in this field. Meanwhile, about 108,000 monographs and uh, uh, journals. Uh. Within the new information service, we are still enlarging this collection. But instead of trying to achieve completeness as before, we now focus on primary source materials and research literature um, uh, and research literature that are too specific for the university libraries in general. For example, we concentrate on primary works of still unknown authors or on special literary genres such as graphic novels. The acquisition scheme follows uh, the peak requirements of research in Roman studies and it includes now uh, films and uh, electronic publications. 
One of the main goals of the new program is to provide direct access to electronic media for German researchers, irrespective of their work location. For this task, a new infrastructure has been created, the Center of Competence for Licensing, Kompetenzzentrum für Lizenzierung, in short KFL, and this center supports the various information services by handling the purchase of digital resources. It also makes available the licensed media to a contractually defined user group on a special platform. A website for the FED Romanistik has been implemented there. You see the address on the slide. Mm. According to the wishes of the research community, the range of products include, during the current period of the project, mainly electronic journals. And with respect to French studies, especially periodicals of the French platform CERN and of the Muse Premium Collection. Currently, all parties involved are still experimenting with license model options and with procedures for granting super-regional access to the resources. After this trial period, we plan to expand the range of products. According to the requirements of the scholars, several activities of the FED tended to improve the findability of subject-specific literature. This concerns, on the one hand, the production of high-quality metadata, and on the other hand, setting up efficient search instruments. Several in-house activities, uh, several in-house indexing activities are undertaken in this context. The acquired media are catalogued and indexed. The tables of contents of monographs and collections are made searchable via catalog enrichment. And the articles of more than 350 periodicals, including about 200 uh, journals concerning French studies, are catalogued. Their records are made available together with the metadata originating from other sources via the searchable, searchable database online contents, OLC. Furthermore, numerous subject-specific websites are catalogued. For this purpose, we use a database uh, provided by Academic Linkshare, which uh, supports a collaborative indexing approach for internet resources. The website concerning French studies are the, uh, uh, the web uh, all the websites concerning French studies are described with the German and French abstracts and indexed with the German and French subject headings, GND and Rameau. By now, the database comprises more than 10,000 records, including more than 5,000 uh, entries related to French studies. The acquired and indexed media are presented together with information coming from other services, service providers and from re the related information services via a new web portal. Mm. It replaces the two former virtual libraries, Vifarom, related to French and Italian studies, and uh, Sibera, related to Spain, Portugal and Latin America. And while the former Viferom had a regional focus and covered French history and French regional studies as well as French philology, the new portal of the FED has a subject-specific focus. This includes cultural and media studies, but no longer history, politics or sociology. The responsibility for these disciplines lies now with the respective specialized information services, especially with the FED history, which is uh, run by the Bavarian State Library. And uh, the new portal of the FED Romanistik is hosted by our partner in Hamburg. One of the main components is a, a, components is a website based on a content management system. It serves to present the services set up by the FED and offers detailed information about various subject-specific resources. For example, it provides assistance when you are looking for relevant databases, periodicals and articles. And you will find tutorials for subject-specific information literacy in French, Spanish and Italian studies as well. The other main component is a search, a search portal based on an index, GBV Central, and a discovery system, um, that's the Viewfind application, Beluga Core. Mm. 
The interface contains a several search options and instruments which tended to help users coming from different places to, in Germany to get access to the acquired documents. In order to make the portal more visible and more attractive for the research community, the bibliographic records are linked with a database of scholars in Roman studies, uh, which is integrated in the well-known platform Romanistik.de. Romanistik.de is the main communication platform for scholars in Roman studies in Germany, and it serves to announce new publications, con congresses, and other events, as well as vacancies uh, for people seeking a job in Roman studies. Mm. The present index of the FED search portal is still under construction. For the moment, it contains only the very basic catalogues set up mainly by the FED itself. We are preparing the integration for further collections, such as uh, the records of the licensed media, the full text collections of Classique Garnier, available via a nationwide license, the French article databases, Revue Org, Percé, Kern, and uh, the catalogue of the Center of Inter for Intercultural French Studies at Mainz, and the press archive of German French Institute uh, of, the, of the German French Institute at Ludwigsburg. Um, there are more and uh, even more relevant, uh, relevant collections. So, as far as possible, we seek further partners with the aim to provide an extensive overview of subject-specific resources and thus to, to improve the findability of so far uh, scattered information for the researchers in Roman studies. Yeah, there are especially two new services on which the FED is concentrating during the current period of the project. And the first is situated at Bonn and concerns the management of research data. Mm, it is based on a collaboration with two partners, the operators of the platform Romanistik.de on the one hand and the working group on digital Roman studies founded by the German Association of Roman Studies on the other hand. The main goals of our project consist in improving the findability of research data in Roman studies and in conceiving adequate measures that may help scholars to handle the data in a sustainable and transparent way. Transparent way. The first step in this direction was the development of a new entry form which enables researchers to report their data to the community on the same level as the traditional publications. It is uh, therefore integrated uh, in the platform Romanistik.de. Thereby, the respective records are also automatically integrated in the database of Romanistik.de. <coughs> Subsequently, the FED organized a workshop with scholars of Romans philology, which aimed to define the main needs of the community. A second workshop will take place at the end of the year bringing together researchers and rep representatives of the key initiatives and infrastructures in the field of digital humanities in Germany. Mm. At the same time, the FED has begun to compile useful information on the handling of research data with respect to scholars and Roman studies via the FED website. Mm. Another project conducted by Hamburg State and University Library is dealing with the field of open access publishing. At first, a survey has, was carried out with the aim to specify the requirements of the community. The results of the survey were considered for further parallel initiatives. Mm. The setting up of an individualized consulting service, the elaboration of a subject-specific offer of information, especially related to legal questions, and the sounding out of options of cooperation with appropriate open access platforms. Furthermore, our partners in Hamburg will organize a workshop in November, which will serve to improve networking between researchers and the respective centers of excellence. Uh, as you may have seen, all initiatives of the FED are develop, uh, developed in close contact with the academic experts. The services are presented via the communication platform Romanistik.de. The contents of the FED portal and Romanistik.de are interlinked as far as possible. 
Mm. The projects uh, concerning the new services are realized together with the respective, initi uh, respective initiatives within the research community, especially the working group on digital Roman studies. In order to guarantee a continuous exchange with the research community, an advisory board has been founded, consisting of the representatives of the professional associations and Romanistik.de. I have mentioned uh, the pro uh, professional associations before. Um, the members of the advisory board come together once or twice a year. Yeah, this structure may suggest that the main target group of the FED consists of, research, of researchers of Roman studies in Germany, and this is naturally the case uh, to a certain extent, um, mainly due to the funding principles of the German Research Foundation. Uh, nevertheless, the services of the FED are not reserved to this group. With the exception of the fee-based electronic media, all services of the FED, especially the services set up by the FED itself, are open access worldwide. At any rate, the discipline of Roman studies in Germany has, by definition, an international orientation. On the one hand, the primary sources originate from many different languages, and on the other hand, the research results are relevant for scholars in the respective countries and therefore need to be avail available worldwide. These uh, constitutive conditions are essential for the orientation of the FED as well mm, and concern practically all fields of the work. This begins with the search portal and ends with the new services where we intensely consider the already existing, uh, existing national and international initiatives, for example the president, uh, present activities in the context of Daria, Clarin, Open Edition, etc. So it goes without saying that the FED is open to further partnerships and we are very interested in the projects that are presented uh, here today. Yeah, thank you for your attention. Me now? Ah. Uh, uh, no, the Center for Licensing is a consortium and there is Göttingen State and University Library and now uh, also the Bavarian State uh, uh, Library and uh, um, uh, Berlin uh, State uh, Library um, and uh, uh, they are working together for this and they are uh, doing the licensing, uh, licensing uh, for all the information services, nearly all the information services. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, this may be a question for the discussion later but I'm really interested in hearing from both of you this relationship uh, the ratio between hiring new staff, hiring temporary staff, and retraining existing staff. Is there a, um, you know, was that a barrier? I mean, how much effort did that take? And do you have retraining, or did you transition just by hiring new staff with new skill, skills? Yeah, for the new services, we are hiring new staff uh, within the project, uh, and it's, it's, it's also funded. Uh, it's funded by the uh, German Research Foundation, and um, uh, for the uh, regular staff, uh, we are trying to learn. By the way, done this. Okay. <clears throat> yeah, concerning the staff, it, it is actually uh, a problem. You, you have to find um, the new staff um, that is really knowledgeable and you have to incorporate uh, them into your IT structure. And um, because when, when they are new, they, they don't know the, the structure of, of the house itself. So in, in a way, um, the tasks amalgamate, I must say, in, in the end. Al although we, we hire new staff, we, we need desperately our eye own IT services to um, develop new things. Um, but it will be a question, of course, once the digital services have been set up and the cycle of um, ends, uh, of fund, the funding cycle ends, what will happen with the temporary staff? That's clear. You mentioned Daria and Clarin and some of the other higher level, um, I shouldn't say higher level, but more European-wide networks that you're interested in. Can you speak a little more to how you would interact with, with those? Mm, uh, 
Mm. Uh, you are thinking of the initiatives uh, we are uh, considering for the um, uh, new projects. Um, these initiatives uh, um, are uh, uh, already implemented in, on, on a European level and, there are, uh, and uh, on our workshops uh, we have uh, the researchers uh, or the representatives from Germany and uh, uh, we have also invited uh, um, uh, representatives on the European uh, level for this and so mm. And, uh, the, the initiatives uh, in them, uh, themselves are already uh, um, on a, uh, on a uh, 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 European level. Okay. It's okay. okay, so um, today I would like to introduce you to um, a project I've been working on at the BNF uh, since the beginning of last year, so beginning of 2016. So it's quite a new project, it's called CORPUS, which is not an acronym for anything, it's just a non-imaginative word for <laughs> saying what we, <laughs> what we are doing, which is basically giving access to corpora of data to researchers. Um, the idea of this project was born um, when we started to observe that more and more uh, researchers in various uh, domains uh, approached the BNF um, to ask for a corpora of uh, digital collections um, in a form that was not the form that we usually delivered to the public. Um, if I can explain that, uh, the idea is that uh, the, the, the user interfaces that we have designed to give access to our digital collections until now, so yeah, either on uh, Gallica, our digital library, or uh, the web archives, um, or even the catalogues. Um, these uh, interfaces are meant to access the documents in a way that is very similar to what happens in a traditional library reading room. So you have one researcher, they come to the library, they ask for a document, they, they read it, and they use it whatever way they want. Um, but that's one document at a time. And, uh, and with these uh, new perspectives, we started seeing more and more uh, researchers who wanted to get, get their hands on the raw data uh, because they wanted to manipulate with their own tools and they didn't want to read one document at a time. They wanted to have access to the collection as a whole, to have a more distant view, uh, distant way of reading, not, not reading one page after the other, like you reading a regular book, but reading through tools. So what we could call text and data mining, even if this uh, expression is sometimes a bit difficult to define. So as we saw more and more of these types of demands, uh, we had issues with that because each demand was a new thing for us. We had to redesign uh, completely the process of uh, wrapping our heads uh, uh, around what was the researcher asking for? Was it possible to deliver it? Uh, did we need to build new processes or new tools to deliver it? Um, does it have a cost? Who should bear the costs? All these questions were coming to us again and again and we were re reinventing the wheel uh, every time we had s such requests. It was not very often, but maybe once or twice a year we had to, to rebuild this process of delivering a corpus for, for that kind of purpose. So uh, at some point we decided that we needed to work um, on a sustainable way uh, to meet these kind of requests. And that's how the Corpus uh, project was, was born. So, um, so we, we started in, um, in 2016 uh, and this project is part of um, internal research program at the BNF. So every, every um, four years, well, previously it was three years, but now it's four years, um, there is a, an internal call for projects uh, at the BNF so that uh, the, the people who want to, to, to do research projects on the collections uh, can apply for specific research funding internally. So this, uh, this call for project for the first time was open to subjects that were not, were not 
uh, directly related to collections, so not only studying the collections, but also uh, developing new ways of building research on, um, on digital uh, material. So we proposed this project uh, to, to work on designing this future service that will allow us to provide access to digital corpora for researchers in a sustainable way, uh, providing them data, but maybe not only data, maybe also tools uh, to analyze uh, the collections in digital form. And we, we really need to work in agreement with the intellectual property rights, uh, copyright and privacy legislation. So the way we decided to address this question was to uh, experiment with researchers during three years uh, on three different types of corpora. I'm going back to this in a minute. And then the fourth year was dedicated to um, drive the conclusions of, uh, of this work, like an iterative uh, work with the researchers, and then design the future new service. So here you can find the URL to the description of the project, which is um, obviously in French. So what are the digital collections that we are talking about here? Um, there are uh, three types of collections that are in the scope of the project. Uh, the first uh, collection is our, our digital uh, library, Gallica, uh, and also its internal uh, version, uh, Gallica Intramuros. Uh, which is the version that you have access to when you are inside uh, the reading room. So I took a screenshot of uh, Gallica Intramuros because Gallica, you can see it on your regular computer, and Gallica Intramuros is the one that you can only see if you come to the BNF. Um, so if you count also the, this material that is available only on site for copyright reasons, you get about 4.5 million uh, digitized items in Gallica. Not all are from the BNF. We have more than 300 uh, partners that also provide digital collections, uh, either referenced in Gallica through the OAIP image protocol or integrated on our own servers. Uh, they, give, they give us the digital files and we integrate them. So 4.5 million digitized item is quite a significant uh, mass of, of data that we are starting to have. And, um, and yeah, so the, the, the interface of Gallica is really designed to, uh, to search this material uh, using uh, regular search engine, which search in the OCR when it's available or in the metadata when there is no OCR or it's not text material. Uh, but this is quite basic. And then the people are uh, using Gallica for reading, for close reading, if you want, reading the document page after page. So the Gallica doesn't, in, in, as such, deliver a service to uh, retrieve a corpus of raw data that you could analyze with your own tools. Um, then the second corpus that is in scope is the web archives. Uh, that's about uh, less than 800 uh, terabytes of data. Um, I won't say much about this because Ariane is going to tell you everything about web archiving at BNF uh, this afternoon. Um, uh, my focus here is really on the idea that there again we have a very significant mass of data and the main way uh, that you access this data is through the Wayback Machine. So for those of you who have uh, ever uh, accessed web archives, if you haven't you can try it at archive.org. Um, the Wayback Machine is basically a system that replays the web uh, the way it was when we captured it, uh, or at least as close as can be from the way it was. So you, you replay the websites one by one. And there again, what's interesting in this collection is not only to replay the websites, but to, to have a, a panoramic view of everything that has been archived over the years, and maybe what are the, the big what, are, what is the big picture of the number of websites that were available on such topic and, and things like that. We don't have full text indexing of this archive because it's too big and um, it's a significant technological challenge. So, so if you want to search for something in there, um, there are different ways. Again, Ariane will, will explain. But uh, we have more and more requests of uh, accessing the raw data to, for the researchers to build their, their own tools. And of course, this collection uh, is legal deposit. It's only available on site. So 
uh, you cannot access it on, on the web. Uh, and the, the third collection that is uh, in scope of the Corpus project is the, the metadata. So it can seem a bit strange for librarian to say that uh, our metadata, our catalog, is actually a collection. Uh, but uh, as we are legal deposit library, uh, since uh, several decades we've been cataloging everything that is published uh, on the French soil. So that has a meaning. I mean, there, there is a lot of material that is cataloged by the BNF teams and that is maybe not that interesting as such. It's not scientific material. Uh, it can be, I don't know, uh, self-publishing material, uh, uh, things that are uh, distributed uh, through uh, any channels like uh, professional channels, companies. Uh, free material that is uh, flyers that are in the distributed industries, thing like that, uh, any kind of material. And um, and as we catalog everything, there again more and more people are interested in not only using this metadata to access the documents, which is the primary goal of a library catalog, but also to analyze the data in itself because of what it tells about the status of the French publishing industry at some point in time. So, uh, since a few years, we have uh, this publication, the Observatoire du Dépôt Légal, which is a yearly, um, a, a yearly report on what we can learn on the French publishing industry through legal deposits. And we analyze our data, we extract our, our data from the catalog to analyze what are the, I don't know, the most studied uh, persons, uh, the, the, the age uh, of the, the authors or things like that. The, this year the, the observatoire was focused on music um, and uh, this, uh, this analysis of data is also very interesting uh, because we also distribute the raw data as open data so that other people can also build their own analysis. So we propose something, there is a focus on the topic, but people can also grab the, the raw data and build their own uh, interpretation. So before we started the, the Corpus project, I told you that uh, we started it because we already had requests from researchers. And uh, I've taken examples, and what I've done is I've categorized uh, these requests in three use cases. So there are three reasons why researchers would come to us and ask for a Corpus. Um, the first uh, reason is uh, because the Corpus in itself is really, really interesting. So th this is the use case that I call the corpus as a source, because we have some corpuses that are in themselves so interesting that some researchers want to m try to mine them using different tools just to see what happens. And this is the case of the newspapers. So we have been working in, in a European project called European Newspapers, and uh, there is um, a researcher who is uh, actually part of the BNF staff. His name is Jean-Philippe Moreux, and he's, he's a really an expert in uh, OCR and uh, doing a lot of things with uh, analyzing the result of the OCR for the, for the, for the newspapers, for the press. And uh, he has conducted a whole lot of different analysis on these documents to demonstrate that it's so interesting, you can get many things out of it, out of the layout, you can analyze uh, the pictures, you can analyze uh, the ads, uh, and learn a lot of things uh, from this. So um, I don't have time to enter into detail, but really the use case is here that uh, this material is so interesting that mining it will give you results, either for managing the collection from the library point of view or for whatever research you want to conduct on this material. The second use case is completely different. In this use case, the corpus is really used as a sandbox uh, by a team of engineers. So in that case, it was um, people from a laboratory of an engineering university, uh, the laboratory is called ETIS, and uh, they wanted to test an algorithm that does uh, automatic indexing on images. So the idea is the, you, you put the images and the algorithm tries to tell you if it's a horse or if it's a house or if it's something else. And uh, they had tried, they are, they are, it's a, so it's a, an image mi mining algorithm, and they had tried it on several 
uh, training corpuses that are available on the internet. But they came to us because they said that the cultural heritage material was much more challenging than any other type of data they had to work with because it was so diverse. And uh, it's much more challenging to find the idea of a horse in the cultural material because uh, if you look at what we have at the BNF uh, in the digitized uh, stuff, you can have a horse on the middle uh, from, uh, from the Middle Ages, you can have a horse on a photography, you can have a horse on a, an old print, uh, you can have a drawing of a horse, and it's very difficult for an algorithm to tell you that all these are actually the same idea of horse because it's so diverse. Uh, also, the textures of the images are different, some are in black and white, the prints, they have the engravings, marks, well, all this makes it very challenging for the algorithm. So they came to us not because they are interested in cultural heritage access, but because they wanted to, to test their, uh, their machines on some challenging data with someone who is actually a real expert to be able to tell them, okay, your machine is going completely the wrong way, or this is really interesting. And the, the third use case um, that uh, we had, uh, and there again I won't tell much because I think Ariane also chose to, to, to tell you about that, but um, it's interesting from a certain point of view. Um, it's, it's the corpus as an interface uh, between uh, the researcher and the, the conclusions that they want to draw. And in that case, um, it was a research that was uh, led by Valérie, who is also in the room, so I hope I won't say too many things that are not right. But um, the, the, I, I, the idea at the beginning was to analyze what goes on on the web or when you distribute uh, digitized material. So they wanted to analyze how people t uh, use cultural heritage material on the web when it's di uh, digitized and made available by library. So it was not at all at the beginning a project to mine web archives. But because the web archives were there and they were um, more uh, secure from a legal point of view and maybe easier to use from a certain point of view because they were curated, um, it was interesting from the, for the research team uh, to use that material, that corpus, uh, to try to draw their conclusions on something else. So here uh, they finally turned to us because they had a specific question and the answer was potentially residing inside the corpus. So it's not the corpus per se, like in the newspapers example, it's not uh, just to test machines like in the second example, it's different use case where the researchers try to think okay, how can I answer these specific questions? And finally turns to the library saying, okay, you have a corpus that probably answers my question, so can I grab my hands on this corpus? So the type of thing that they've done on this is um, link mining, which I show here. And sorry, I don't have time to tell you more about it, although it would be so interesting. But there is a lot of documentation online and you can access it with the link. So then all these three use cases were before we started actually the corpus projects. What are we doing inside the corpus project? Uh, we are uh, iterating with rich researchers on similar uh, types of, of research. Uh, the, the, the aim of the project, as I said, is not the research in itself. It's observing how the researchers uh, use the collections, uh, what kind of uh, access they need. Uh, do they need the raw data? Do they need help to handle the, the corpus? So the first year we partnered with a team um, from the CNRS which is called uh, Web 90s, Web of the 90s, and we're studying the Web of the 90s. So uh, we designed for them a specific interface called uh, Archive Web Labs, which uh, gives a full text indexing of the specific corpus that they are working on. So the idea is that we cannot index everything because it's too big, but we can do it for a specific collection if we have a research team that says, okay, that's the one collection I'm interested in. We've done a lot of other things. I'm a bit short to be able to talk to you about that. Um, also related thing that I won't talk about because I know that Valérie is also presenting that later today. Um, it's not within the Corpus project, but it's really related. We've worked on the analysis uh, of uh, logs, so that technical data, logs from Gallica to try to analyze the, the usage. Um, and there again, we had very interesting issues on uh, how to how to provide the log to the researcher, how to provide him with a platform that he can use to, to work on, uh, privacy issues, the, the data needed to be anonymized, uh, things like that. 
So finally, what comes out, uh, we're only half of the project, but what comes out already is that we have very uh, wide array of different situations in terms of what are the skills of the researchers and what are their expectations. On the one hand, um, of, of, the, of the panel, you can see that uh, you have researchers who have a very good knowledge of collections, historians for instance, uh, they know what they can find in the collections, but sometimes they lack the technical skills, uh, they don't necessarily have an engineer in their team that can uh, build the tools to analyze the data, so they have high expectations in terms of uh, what kind of access we can give, what kind of tools we can provide them with so that they can use the collections. They know that there is something interesting in there, but they don't have the tools. Then on the other end of the spectrum, you have uh, the people who are using the corpus as a sandbox. They are really um, interested in training their own tools. So this also raises interesting challenges, uh, especially when the data is protected, like uh, legal deposit data that is only accessible on site. Uh, the researcher is working from his laboratory or sometimes from his home, is working between midnight and 2 a.m. So he doesn't want to be uh, forced to come to the library. And even if he comes, he wants to use his own software that he built. So uh, we need to find a way to work with them in that specific uh, framework. And uh, this year on Web Archives, we are working with, uh, with just two seconds. We are working with, um, with a team who is doing linguistics. So they are uh, very high on uh, engineering uh, the tools and they want to use uh, protected data. So we will learn what happens with them. And in the middle, they are all asking for expertise, training, uh, education, both on the tools, on the data, on the formats, and on the collections, what's in there, and they need us to, to, to work with them. So this is what we are uh, expecting to build, a service where we will address all the different aspects of this issue, uh, legal aspects, organization, how, we, how, how we're going to deal with these requests, what skills are needed, what human resources are, ne are needed, do we need a physical space, uh, do we need an IT infrastructure that is, that is dedicated to that, um, how, how are we going to disseminate the data online or on site. So this project that uh, we, call, we call temporarily the Digital Scholarship Lab, it doesn't exist yet. We are running a survey uh, with our uh, researcher uh, co partners to analyze their needs currently and uh, we will know more by the beginning of next year. We are also trying to know what other libraries are already doing, uh, both in France and in the world. We have uh, interesting experiences uh, in other countries, like in the British Library or in the KB in the Netherlands. So we are trying to analyze all that, and um, it helps us um, try to think how we are going to build our own, our own service. Thank you. Okay, we can have a couple of questions for Emmanuel, and then um, maybe you would like to come back up and we can all discuss. Well, thank you for this very exciting presentation and congratulations for the work. Um, I was wondering, how big is your staff and uh, how is it divided? Like, how many technicians do you have and how do you work with these people, like the linguists or the ones that were doing um, image algorithms? Are they getting, getting paid or are they just, you know, collaborating somehow? Uh, most of the projects are actually funded uh, projects, so sometimes the library is, funding, is funded as a partner uh, to participate in the project. At other times, it's uh, only the research team who is funded and the library uh, helps. Um, currently, the team is, uh, the library is a big library. We are more than 200 uh, people working at the BNF, oh, two, 2,000, sorry, uh, working at the, at the BNF. So, uh, but, but these 2,000 people are doing very different things. And um, the, for instance, the, the IT staff is 100. I'm going to not say things that are stupid in terms of figures. So 100 people in the IT staff, but uh, not all of them are knowledgeable of this, of course. They are doing very different things. So um, uh, although it's a big library, uh, there are a few persons uh, that, that are working at one point or another on this project, may, maybe 20 persons uh, currently. 
uh, and uh, beyond a few experts like uh, Jean-Philippe, whom I, I mentioned earlier, who are really focused on uh, research use of digital collections, um, most of them are involved at, at a point or another, but they're not doing this full time. So currently we don't have dedicated staff for the, this project. Um, we have a temporary help uh, that is funded by, by Corpus, as I told you, it's a funded project uh, within the BNF. So what is funded is that we have uh, a temporary uh, staff, uh, five months each year, to, to help us with some of the tasks. So currently we have someone working on this, um, this survey. Uh, and, uh, and otherwise it's mainly the teams who are in charge of the collections. Uh, either the technical teams or the collections team who, who get involved in these projects and work with the researchers. It's okay. Yes, so I, I didn't uh, um, take it as an example because it will be next year, but um, next year we, you, we have a project to, to work specifically on this. Um, we have a service that is called data.bnf.efr, which is a service that distributes uh, the library data uh, as linked data. And uh, this service has proven very useful for researchers because uh, uh, I don't know why they don't want to work with Mark. I really don't understand, but, um, but they are very happy with the idea that we are distributing the catalog data in a form that is somehow easier. I, I say somehow because uh, linked data in RDF is not always very easy also, but at least it's a format that is a standard of the web, so it's easier than MARC. And um, often they, uh, they ask us to distribute uh, JSON, for instance. Um, and uh, th they are really interested with this and the links between these data sets and other data sets like uh, VIA for, or Wikipedia. So they have started uh, using this data set to, to study things like uh, how many female authors produced books in France in the 20th century or things like that. And, uh, and they come to us because they have questions, they don't know how to use the data, they want expertise on the data. So this is also something that has started already and that we will uh, investigate um, further next year. Yes, please sit. <laughs> um, I, I would like to simply open the floor to questions from anyone for any of our speakers or from the speakers to each other. And um, Thank you for these wonderful presentations. What I would like to ask about is how faculty and researchers figure into your decisions. Um, how much contact is there with faculty? How do you talk to them? And for the German presenters in particular, how do faculty feel about this shift from a focus on collections to a focus on uh, delivery of digital and research uh, con constructing research communities. I feel like it's a little bit different in, in the European context from the American context because those of us who, su who are subject librarians think more about our the faculty at our institution and I'm just really interested in this broader approach to the research community that you must take to build your services. Do you hear me? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> uh, yes, I, I think it was rather difficult uh, to uh, bring the researchers uh, or, or to, to, to uh, 
have a representative range of researchers of the Roman studies in Germany as partners. Um, and, uh, uh, but uh, um, I, I think uh, the context uh, uh, and the communication is better than before, uh, because before I think uh, uh, many uh, scholars didn't even know that there was a subject <laughs> collection for the uh, uh, for our um, uh, our discipline, and now we are invited to present the services a service uh, uh, during their. Uh, 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 regular assemblies, and uh, they uh, and and uh, they uh, are uh, uh, making suggestions how uh, how to improve the service, and so it's uh, I think it's a very uh, positive development. Um. I think it depends also a bit on the subject. Um, so we found ourselves um, in the situation that um, we had um, also to explain um, the scholars that there is now such a shift um, in the funding policy and um, scholars with a background in the humanities um, um, really strongly rely still on, on printed materials and there are very different uh, expectations as to what digital services um, are to be expected or sometimes they also want to develop um, projects themselves and get other funding and afterwards they come back and, and want the, the data preserved at our institution which may become yeah, difficult um, as I said because we, we need standards and we have to talk to them about standards. So it is actually, um, yeah, we, we, we came in a sort of communication and, um, and we, had, we have many con conversations, um, and, um, but we had uh, to outreach um, to them. And um, the, the feedback we receive um, is, is quite diverse and, and the expectations as well. So. For us, it's uh, a bit challenging <laughs> to have that discussion with, uh, with the universities because, um, as I mentioned this morning, BNF is uh, under the Ministry of Culture in France, and uh, so we are not part of the higher education network. So the discussion with um, universities and faculties is uh, mainly started on projects and um, also uh, on uh, the, the main driver is the collections. So these research teams uh, come to us because we have the collections, either digital or not, and, uh, and, and they want to collaborate on making these collections more accessible for them and for the community. So that's a very strong driver, and I think that uh, we probably will be able to partner uh, with uh, several uh, universities in setting up our digital scholarship lab and uh, also we are now part of a, an effort in front that is called uh, Collex which is a collections of excellence um, and uh, this is a network of uh, university libraries uh, focused on uh, shared uh, collections and services uh, between the, the libraries the university libraries in France so we are part of it and uh, we are strengthening our, our our contribution for the community. Good morning and thank you for your presentations. Um, I have a very similar question or perhaps as follow-up. Uh, Dr. Zolmor said uh, the feedback is diverse and there are often many expectations. Who's the decider? Who balances the weight of opinion from your scholarly feedback, who decides what are the appropriate services, uh, and it really, what, how does this work in practice, uh, according to the expectations of the, the library or perhaps the, the Deutsche Forschungsgemeinschaft? I, I think we uh, make uh, certain offers, and it has a lot to do with um, making the collections more accessible and. Um, 
ex giving explanations how to better access. On the other hand, of course, um, there is a demand for raw data. Um, so, um, and, and we have uh, very diverse uh, requests across uh, the different um, specialized information services, um, which is, yeah, we, which is really difficult in, in that uh, respect as, as we have to try to integrate it into our infrastructure. So we, we try to be generic, but um, the demands are very highly specialized. So, um, but I, I think um, we, we rather offer things and, and then we discuss and develop models that are outside. Hi, this question is mainly for Emmanuel, but maybe um, for all of you. I'm wondering that once you create a, once you create one of these specialized corpora for a specific research project or a research team, once they're done with it, do you keep a copy or do you preserve that corpus as an individual corpus for future users? I would say it depends on the corpus, uh, how uh, specific or specialized it is. Um, in the case of uh, the web archives, the work we've been doing last year, uh, it's really reusable because uh, the corpus is um, uh, everything that we have from the 90s. So this is a copy of uh, a corpus that was uh, provided to us by Internet Archive because we were not archiving at that time. Uh, but what we've done, full text indexing of this corpus, is probably reusable for other people interested in this uh, in this time period. So, so really, um, when the, whenever the, the corpus is something that may be reusable, uh, it, it's not always the case. Um, we will try to to make it available. So one of the things we are doing um, this year is uh, we are creating a website that is dedicated to providing access to APIs and data sets. And on this uh, website, we will distribute, uh, when, when we are allowed to do it, we will distribute the corpus that have been built in previous projects that are reusable. That's the case of the European newspapers corpus, for instance. Mm -hmm. But yes, it's... it's you, you said that every researcher needs to be addressed in a very specific way this morning, so it's not yeah, always very easy I mean, to reuse. The, the point is that you can, uh, of course, uh, try to preserve the data, but you cannot always preserve all the functionalities um, you have developed in that context, and, and that is a problem. So the data is easy, but the tools, yeah. it's very easy to reuse yeah. And, yeah. To, and, to, and to maintain. When it comes to preservation. <laughs> Thank you for your presentations, all of you. Um, I'd like to come back to a question Emmanuel Barmes rose uh, on her last slide. Um, that was, do research libraries have a future as a physical space? And I'd like to add, beyond being a depository for or of uh, the cultural heritage. Um, I'm asking because public libraries are reinventing themselves as cultural centers, as external living rooms and maker spaces. Um, and what could or should research libraries do? That would be my question. As I raise the question, I can try to answer first. <laughs> um, we, we have, we have um, I don't know if it's a chance, <laughs> but uh, we have some collections that are only accessible on site, so we have to have a physical space. But also, one of the things that came out of the discussions that we had with researchers in the Corpus project was that they, they, they needed space, they wanted space, they wanted a place where they can meet and work as a group and uh, meet the experts of the BNF physically. They wanted to, to meet the librarians uh, physically. So, although they also want to work uh, online and to have access to as many things as possible outside the library, uh, they are also in demand of a physical space. Um, I must say I have chaired for many years the IFLA Library Buildings and Equipment section and we had a long discussion about spaces and there are very similar developments between uh, public libraries and research libraries in that respect. So you still need physical spaces. Yeah. 
Yeah, and we in, in the university library uh, even have the impression that the users prefer space to collections and uh, they come uh, uh, because, uh, because they want to learn in uh, our rooms. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering if each of you could talk a little bit about uh, assessments, how you're going to judge and evaluate the success of your projects and whether to advance them further or to make adjustments. Okay, this is a very interesting question. Um, one of the things um, that um, we have observed in the previous projects that we have done is that uh, it's very difficult to assess the project both from the library point of view and from the researcher point of view. Um, I will give you an example to try to explain that. Uh, the, the second use case, the sandbox use case that I presented, uh, it was a team of engineers and they wanted to, to test their algorithm on our corpus. The expectation of the library was um, to have an automatic indexing system to help the catalogers uh, index the images. The expectation of the researchers was to test the algorithm. So after one year of testing, they showed all the ways that the algorithm had failed, and they were really happy about it. <laughs> so, so they have a very detailed paper on how, how it failed because of the diversity of the corpus, how it failed of the because of the nature of the image that they had, and, and they had whole lots of improvements, uh, potentials, through this study because they knew where the algorithm did fail and they could improve it afterwards. But the, the librarians were very disappointed because they didn't have an automated indexing system in the end. So, yes, uh, first, I would say the first rule of the assessment of the success of the project is uh, to be well aware when you start the project of what were the results that you were trying to achieve and make sure that you don't mix the expectations of a, a librarian towards a tool that makes the analysis of the collection easier with the expectation of the researcher who is actually doing full research. Um, yes, as, as I already said, the, um, the evaluation of the specialized information services, which are still at a rather early stage, will, is about to start, actually. They, um, they are collecting the data that will be um, done by an external company. Um, However, the, I also think that what you usually um, take as, as an, a certain sign how to evaluate, like usage statistics, they, they will not be very meaningful when, when it comes to electronic resources, for instance, um, be, because um, we uh, obtain lots of licenses and electronic licenses that are very cost intensive and uh, you provide them to a very special and specialized public and, and, um, and sometimes they are not accessible to, to all students or undergraduate students, they are accessible for research. And that might imply that the usage st statistics of certain products is rather low. Um, so, but that is not the necessary indicator. So on, on the other hand, um, you might observe um, the figures, the lending figures of the libraries for, for print. That might be an indicator as well as to, to balance these two worlds. Yeah, and the problem is to find uh, uh, significant indicators because uh, um, the statistic, statistics uh, are not very meaningful uh, also. Uh, because uh, the, um, uh, our services uh, are answering to the peak requirements of the research and uh, so um, uh, we, we can, uh, can't always expect to have many users for some databases or some uh, offers. Uh, you have all talked about um, researchers coming to you and figuring out what researchers want. Do you concern yourself at all with um, educating your researchers on tools, methods, um, relaying that information to students? Is there any 
educational, pedagogical infrastructure that you are um, envisioning as part of um, these projects? Um, we do what we call road shows. <laughs> so, um, we, they go out to um, congresses and inform uh, about the, the services. So that's the way how we try to advertise um, the services. Uh, yeah, we are doing the same thing and uh, we are uh, um, announcing new services on the platform uh, uh, used by the uh, researchers, Romanistik.de, uh, I have already, already presented this. Uh, and uh, as, uh, as far as it concerns information literacy, there are tutorials uh, for students uh, on uh, the FED port, uh, search portal. Mm -hmm. I think one of the main issues that we have currently with training, I don't know if the same for you, uh, is that uh, they don't want to be trained. <laughs> they think they know everything already. <laughs> and, um, and, and especially if, if they are looking for some kind of education, they want it to be really tailored to their needs. So they are more in, in search of uh, an exchange with a collection expert or technical expert than of a training that would be ready-made uh, for, for general public. And uh, there are also other institutions in France who are taking care of, uh, of training. So, so we are not really focusing on that, but this year we are exper experimenting workshops where we are just showing what we do, what tools we use, and, uh, and sharing that with them. And, and we'll see if they, uh, if they want to, to further the exchange of that. I would like to come um, back to a uh, question Dr. Sommer raised um, in her last uh, slide. Uh, does permanence and sustainability still matter? Um, I would like to ask, what's your answer? It's a question to all of you. Um, my, my personal opinion is that, of course, uh, it still matters and uh, we, we should do uh, everything to, to support uh, that. Um, but um, we have to acknowledge, actually, the, the fact that um, the new system um, sees um, the development of the digital services rather in a laboratory. Um, um, background and, and there is of course um, competition between uh, the single institutions um, who offer services. So um, there, there might be a greater variety and a more heterogeneity um, what concerns this uh, world and, and I think we are more or less in an experimental phase at the moment. And um, yeah, I, I suppose um, the best solutions will turn out and have to be uh, modeled in a way that they will be sustainable. May, may I play the devil's advocate here? <laughs> Sometimes we shouldn't sustain things. <laughs> uh, librarians has a very strong focus on, on persistency and making everything very sustainable. But in the research area, sometimes it's also good to have things that are developed quickly and then failed and then we don't sustain and then we build something else. So it's a change of culture that is very difficult to achieve for us in National Library. But on some topics like tools, we know, we, we know by experience that these tools won't last 20 or 30 or 50 years. So how much do we invest in building them in a sustainable way while we do know that they are not long-term tools? Thank you very much for the presentations. My question is for Emmanuel, actually. Um, you mentioned several times that some collections in the digitized corpus are not accessible outside of the institution. You have to come in to use them. Can you please uh, elaborate a little bit more on why? If it is available in electronic format, are there any restrictions uh, that prevent for uh, that material to be uh, in the web, openly? 
I didn't want to talk about that because I think Ariane has it in her talk, but <laughs> I can still uh, answer the question and, and she will tell you more about it later. But it's essentially it's because of copyright and in France the legal deposit law says that uh, everything that, is, that enters the library via legal deposit should be accessed only in the premises. So that goes also for the legal deposit in digital form.